thanks for joining us for the second in our series on what is AI. We kicked off this conversation with AI Now's Chief Advisor, Meredith Whitaker, and now we continue it with Lucy Suchman, an incredibly deep and insightful thinker with a profound history engaging with and organizing um, against the use of AI as a means of control. Lucy's work really has established the field of human-computer interaction, a field made particularly salient by the introductions of systems like ChatGPT, and we're so grateful to have her long view on the evolution of AI. I thought we might start by asking a pretty simple question that is also a very complex question, which is what do we even mean by artificial intelligence? So I have a kind of threefold answer to that question. First, I think of artificial intelligence as a subfield of computer science um, since around the beginning of the 1950s. So we're talking then about a, a disciplinary subfield uh, of computer science. Um, and second, in its currently dominant forms, AI refers to uh, a collection of, of techniques and technologies that are focused on finding statistical correlations, uh, statistical correlations that then get named by us patterns. Uh, so AI techniques involve extracting those patterns from very large data sets and then mapping them to systems of meaning uh, of classification that we uh, as humans create. Um, and then third, I would say that AI is a floating signifier, and I'd be glad to say more about what I mean by that. But the main point is that AI it isn't a thing. It's not a thing in the sense that current media coverage would suggest, um, but rather it's a it's a technological project, which I, I would argue actually a relatively small number of people are heavily invested uh, in this project. And just to give you an example of, of how the, the thingness of AI gets promoted, um, I was in the UK last month and there was a headline in the Daily Mail, um, it's a very fine British newspaper, uh, that read, quote, AI could wipe out humanity. And this was, of course, in response to the recent letter at the time from experts basically setting their hair on fire about how AI is an existential threat, uh, but referring to AI this way as if it were a thing with this autonomous agency is a form of mystification that I believe really serves the interests of the promoters of these technologies. Uh, Ryan Callow from the University of Washington recently pointed out, I think really nicely, that convincing everyone that AI is a very, very powerful, autonomous, out of control thing uh, is actually less costly for those who are invested in the project of AI than, than becoming accountable for who the AI project benefits now and who it injures, because doing that would actually require addressing, uh, for example, the problem of surveillance business models, um, the exploited human labor required to extract data uh, and train data models. So these existing arrangements uh, and the injuries that result from what is effectively the automation of historical patterns of profile and, and discrimination, um, you know, particularly as those are applied in automated decision systems. Those are the real threats to, I think, making other more just worlds possible. There's so much to dig into there. To start, I would love to delve a little bit deeper into that term floating signifier. Can you unpack, you know, what's what's underlying that term? What does it imply about AI and the way that its thingness kind of emerges in very different ways. So this is a term that comes from the anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss, who coined the phrase floating signifier uh, to name a, a word that suggests that it has a, you know, a very specific referent, but actually works to evade being pinned down. And what it, that does is it maximizes the suggestive power of the word. So in this case, Everyone who's uncertain about what AI means, and I would include their popular media commentators, policymakers, publics, basically, uh, you know, we're left to assume that, that others know what it is. Somebody else knows what we're talking about. And then I think the situation is made worse by the lures of anthropomorphism. So we're saying that big time with chat GPT. Um, those lures work both for developers and for those who are encountering the technologies. And there's also a tendency towards circularity in standard definitions of AI. So for example, that AI refers to computational systems that are capable of demonstrated 
you know, demonstrating human-like intelligence, which is a, a very common definition of AI among practitioners and doesn't really help to specify uh, what, what we're talking about. But if we understand AI instead as a project, it's a project that's really, uh, as I mentioned, about scaling up practices of datafication. And datafication is built on systems of classification. Then, you know, then both the signifier AI and all of its associated technologies basically generate um, what a philosopher of science, Helen Varon, uh, has, I think, really nicely framed as a, a hardening of the categories. So it ignores all of the situated practices of classification through which categories get made and put to work, all of the things that get uh, lost in those those practices of classification and all of the politics and, and the consequences of that. And I could point here um, for those who are interested to a classic text in science and technology studies by, by Jeff Bowker and Lee Starr, uh, sorting things out, classification and its consequences, which sets out the, the issues that are at stake here very beautifully. It strikes me that it also affords claims that are situated in a kind of technical complexity that both elides those the messiness of those processes of, of datafication, while also saying to, say, regulators, this is too complicated for you to weigh in on, just kind of leave it to us. As we saw Eric Schmidt say in a recent interview, that AI is far too technically complex um, for government to have anything to do with. And thus, industry is the only player capable of of introducing any kind of friction into the, the development and deployment of these systems. Absolutely. I mean, we see these bodies of experts, and I'm thinking here about the succession from the Defense Innovation Board, which was set up in 2016, to the National Security Commission on AI, now the Special Competitive Studies Project. So these advisory committees to the government are made up of members, many of whom have serious conflicts of interest. Uh, because they're coming out of industry, they're coming out of academic institutions that receive funding for AI. But the argument is, well, these are the people who have the expertise, right? Like who who else would we talk to? Uh, and I think the, the mystification um, that I was talking about before works, as you suggested, to, to reinforce the role of expertise and to obscure those conflicts of interest, which I think are enormously consequential and we really should be paying attention to. I remember during our time in FTC, one of the things that I found myself frequently pondering is, you know, when we see these moves to toward technical complexity, often that was almost a red flag. There's something going on deeper under the surface here and, and in need of digging further to see what's really, really happening here. One of the tremendous themes of your body of work has been looking at the diffusion of AI into systems of defense. Um, and I was curious, you know, maybe we can go go there next and, and talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence in many ways originates from military imperatives um, and also the ways its proposed use in defense contexts troubles some of the underlying claims about what AI is even capable of. Yeah, the relations between the military and computing really go back to the beginnings of computing uh, as a technical practice. And, and since particularly since World War II, they've become more and more closely intertwined. And basically, military logics um, rest on the premise that you can have control over war fighting, that that's possible. Uh, and the idea of modern warfare is that wars can be conducted in a just and, and rational way. And this rests in turn on the, on the idea that command and control has to operate according to a hierarchy where those in command have a really ideally a kind of omniscient God's eye overview of the battle space. And there have been an, a, a history of technological projects aimed at providing uh, that kind of, of God's eye view. Uh, so this is a kind of perennial aspiration on the part of the military. Um, during the Cold War in the 1980s, when I first got involved with these issues, some of your uh, listeners might remember Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense or, or uh, Star Wars initiative, which was based on the idea of computer-controlled missile shield that would defend the U.S. against incoming nuclear missiles. Incredibly problematic for so many reasons. And this was, of course, never actually realized 
But there was also a companion to that initiative called the Strategic Computing Initiative. Uh, and the echoes of that are, are in DOD proposals at the moment for the introduction of AI into war fighting um, now. And back in, in 1983, um, I and my colleagues, Severo Ornstein and Brian Cantwell Smith, wrote a critique of the Strategic Computing Initiative for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And I think much of that critique could be applied to current initiatives that are being uh, put forward by proponents of military AI, like, like Eric Schmidt, um, in collaboration with what I would characterize as uh, technophiles within the U.S. military, people who are very enamored of technology, who believe there can be technological solutions to this long-standing problem that gets referred to as the fog of war, this idea that with enough data, the chaos of warfighting can somehow be rendered uh, into this transparent um, battlefield. And to that end, we get um, the final report of the National Security Commission on AI, which came out uh, in March of 2021. And it calls for a doubling of annual AI-related research and development spending um, by the DOD to, to reach $32 billion by 2026. Again, the National Security Commission on AI made up of people arguably many, if not most of whom, have a deep vested interest in, in that funding. Uh, and then the big return that's promised on that investment is effectively the kind of dissolution of the fog of war um, through what at the moment is named the Joint All-Domain Command and Control, um, JADC2, which again is this idea of somehow uh, perfectly joined up information infrastructure that will feed accurate real-time data into military operations. And if you look at the discourse coming out of the Pentagon about that, all of the focus is on questions of interoperability, um, integration of data sets across the services, and very little attention is paid to the question of data quality, where these data come from, how they're made. Uh, and that's, of course, a question that gets even more problematic when we're talking about um, generative AI, um, the promise of generative, uh, generative AI as a kind of further aspect of a technological solution for military intelligence, which is starting to appear uh, more and more in, in the discourses coming out of, of the DOD. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think has emerged out of some of the more recent discourse on generative AI is that data quality actually does matter a tremendous amount, that you can't solve everything just with larger and larger scale, particularly as you come up against material constraints like access to um, sufficient computing power, which is largely bottlenecked for some of the biggest firms. Um, things like you know whether or not you're able to get chips that are optimized for building and, and deploying AI models. You know, some of the it's almost as though there's a the tension between, you know, access to cloud infrastructure, which are resources that are concentrated within the hands of a few firms, and issues of data and data quality, which again are concentrated in the hands of a of a few firms. Looking at this from the perspective of the battlefield is that it really foregrounds the messiness of where data comes from, um, because data comes from the world. It comes from, you know, the messiness of, of human life. Right. The resources of cloud computing um, and large language models and very, very large data sets and very, very powerful compute processing um, are all in a way uh, we could think of them as inside the machine. That is, they're, they're inside what's effectively a kind of closed world, because once things are in the cloud, as we say, datafication has already been done. And then those processes are running on those data that, that are available. And we know from looking at large language models and, and the chatbot interfaces to them, that the processing of data within those very large corpora has no guarantee of, of validity. Uh, it, it's compelling, it's convincing, it's exploiting um, what we're, we're learning now about the extraordinary regularities of natural language, but there's no accountability for the validity of the results in relation to the world outside the cloud, beyond the cloud. And the whole imaginary of what's referred to in military discourses, uh, they talk about sensor to shooter, real-time situational awareness, that presupposes 
that you have translations from signals, um, you know, whether those are signals generated through sensors of various kinds or so-called human intelligence, things picked up from chat, from other kinds of communications. It assumes that there's some kind of instantaneous translation of those signals into into information, into actionable intelligence. But of course, those signals are highly ambiguous. They're being produced in the midst of the chaos and really the horrors of, of war fighting. And then as the speed intensifies uh, with, in, with increased automation of the processing of, of signals and the making of data, the possibilities for, for judgment, for deliberation, for assessing the validity of the data, uh, assessing who, who's creating the data, where they are coming from, who's doing the translations, that time basically disappears and problems of the reliability of the data really intensify. So there's a whole set of questions for me, not only about what's going on in the cloud, but also the relation of those data corpora to the worlds from which the data are made and in which the, those data, you know, the results of that processing um, has, has effects. And so I think a lot of people know about Project Maven. Um, it's difficult to get information about it for those of us who don't have access to classified information. But we know enough to know that uh, Project Maven is based on this idea of automating the analysis of the enormous amount of full motion video that's being produced by drone surveillance. And uh, the premise is that automated machine learning systems will be able to identify, you know, what they first referred to as objects, um, although we soon learned that those objects included people, vehicles, buildings that, of course, have people in them. Uh, you know, and what we know about image analysis, um, about computer vision we know based really on data sets like ImageNet, which is made up of images scraped from the World Wide Web. And if you think about something um, like, you know, an ISIS pickup truck, which was an example of the kinds of objects that, that should be recognized in Maven or, or an ISIS affiliate, uh, you know, these are identifications that aren't they're not inherent in the objects um, or the persons being referred to. They're attributions that are made uh, to objects and, and people that are based on their association. So it's it's a reading of what the military refers to as as patterns of life and and these assumptions about about what things should look like on the ground uh, and what what constitute you know anomalies is only valid to the degree that it's it's informed by really deep understandings of what's going on on the ground. And to the extent that those understandings are missing, then we're talking really about the crudest forms of stereotyping and stereotyping in situations where there are life and death consequences. So it's not like getting recommended a movie that seems completely off the wall and of no interest to you. These are results that have literally life and death consequences for people. So there are just enormous questions for me that are left unaddressed in in the promotional discourse about these systems. You know, these systems don't have contextual understanding. They don't have the depths of cultural knowledge or emotional capacities. And so just kind of circling back to our originating question, I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts about, you know, how is intelligence being conceptualized in these types of systems or in, you know, the models that underlie them, like neural networks or deep, deep learning? And how, how is this distinct or, or different to other types of AI systems like robotics? You know, AI is such a, an encapsulating term, um, not only um, in its, uh, its, you know, uh, linguistic significance, but also in the type, just the types of material systems that um, it's describing. Um, and I'm curious how, what comes to the surface and how those types of systems inscribe intelligence. So if we think about so-called neural networks, machine learning, um, the currently dominant forms of, of AI. Um, in those cases, again, intelligence is basically the name for these computational processes that are, you know, as I said, detecting statistically significant patterns um, over, over a corpus of data. Uh, and as I said, it's effectively a kind of closed or, or self-contained world uh, that these systems are, are running over. And, you know, maybe it's scaled up. Uh, it's, you know, these are very, very big data sets, which is what we're seeing now. But but still, it's it's self-contained. And then, of course, robotics 
challenges that because robots require action, right? Uh, and robotics requires action in, you know, in what is an open world, the open worlds that we actually live in. But we could also argue, actually, if we think about uh, robotics historically, um, that, that it's been successful in some ways to the extent that the worlds in which robots operate have, have been effectively closed. So you could think about, um, you know, the automated assembly line, uh, where the, the world is, is effectively engineered um, for the needs uh, of, of the robot. Or you could think uh, more recently about the Amazon warehouse, though, again, it's really important to see how crucial humans still are, all the all the humans that are needed in these kinds of, of spaces to, to fill the gaps, to be the kind of peripherals um, for input and output um, for the machines. And in those cases, you've effectively engineered the world to make it safe uh, for the robots, and then you incorporate humans um, to fill the gaps. And so, you know, it, we've seen in the case of self-driving cars, very famously, uh, you know, that robots have also proven to be very difficult to build and deploy safely. And I would say that the relative lack of success in those areas is precisely because those worlds can't be closed. I mean, with self-driving cars, we can imagine that increasingly uh, infrastructures are going to be configured so that highways, um, certain urban areas are, are engineered for self-driving cars and, and their success will be dependent on that. Um, but those would be the measures uh, required, I think, to actually make autonomous vehicles work safely. So this idea about closed and open worlds, I think, is really important. We're thinking about the extent and limits of the capacities of so-called AI systems, the ways um, you know, in which closure is a requirement for their operation and the aspects of our worlds that resist closure um, from driving, you know, in a, in a complex city environment um, to actually to housekeeping, which is also interestingly full of contingencies and has proven to be really hard to automate beyond, you know, we can think about our dishwasher, but again, we're kind of the peripheral to that. We we put the dishes in, the machine then does the washing, and then we put them away. And I think that's actually a pretty good model um, for, for successful robotics um, still uh, to, this, to this day. I'm also curious to like look back in time a bit at different models of constructing intelligence. You know, are, are there, for example... Expert systems was, you know, the problem that many AI scientists were working on for, you know, decades and have largely discarded at this point. I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts about, you know, other other ways of thinking about intelligence that have been considered about over the course of, you know, AI development and, and what we should understand about that. In some ways, I think there are aspects of expert systems that have been incorporated um, into the automated decision systems that we see around us. But the big, big kind of aspiration there uh, of automating expertise, you know, remains unfulfilled. Uh, and there have been powerful challenges really since the 1970s that I think still hold um, by People like Hubert Dreyfus, um, philosopher who wrote the book, What Computers Can't Do. He wrote that in 1979. Then he wrote another book, What Computers Still Can't Do in 1992. Again, I think all of the, the, the critiques uh, in those books still hold. And then we have critiques by computer scientists themselves, um, noticeably, uh, notably Joseph Weizenbaum, who, who Meredith talked about, um, who was the inventor of the first chatbot, basically. And, and also, I think of people like feminist computer scientist Alison Adam, who wrote a wonderful book titled uh, Artificial Knowing Gender and the Thinking Machine. And what these critiques um, focused on were, were several things. First, uh, the fallacy of the kind of universal knower um, that underwrites AI. So particularly back in the time of symbolic AI um, expert systems, uh, this was imagined as the subject S who knows the proposition P in this in this very general formulation. And Alison Adam describes how that kind of universal subject is really the projection of as quite specific, unmarked white European male standpoint, which works uh, by erasing its own specificity and, and treating itself as if it speaks for everyone. But but the actual parochiality um, of 
of the artificial intelligentsia's own knowledge practices uh, in that respect are completely denied. Um, and yet the specificity of our locations really matter uh, for how we know and, and what we know. So that's one really important line of critique. And then there's attending to the place of embodiment, that intelligence isn't a kind of this kind of denatured mental calculative process. Uh, you know, but we know, we know with our bodies, we know through our bodies, we know through our lived experience. Uh, and then of course we know through history and culture and social relations. So anthropologists of, of learning like Jean Lave, who I think about often in relation to, you know, the trope of machine learning, um, have attended to the really foundational role of social relations in the formation of intelligence and the role of our participation in communities of practice in the development of our competencies um, and our capacities. And again, all of those critiques, I think, can still be drawn on to challenge uh, and to understand the limits of the systems that are are now being held up as the advent of of artificial general intelligence of of even you know the surpassing of humans by machines, which is it's really an article of of faith. I mean, there's no evidentiary basis for that. It's just asserted by people who have enough social capital to and enough power to be able to make assertions like that and not be held accountable for them. You know, in our first conversation in these series, um, Meredith Whitaker made the point that one of the key distinctions between generative AI systems, which were sort of driving a lot of the discussions happening around AI today, and previous versions um, of of AI systems, which have already been deployment in deployment in the world around us is that with generative AI, there's an interface. You sort of referenced this a little bit um, just now, but you know, over the course of much of your work, you've grappled with questions about embodiment, about how humans interact with computers. And I'm curious for your own reflections about how you see that surfacing in this moment. Yeah, it really did all start for me at the interface. Um, and in many ways, the analysis that I did back in the 1980s, early 1980s of human-computer interaction, that analysis in some ways seems a bit crude at this point uh, in light of you know the incredible sophistication of large language models, natural language processing, uh, that, you know, as many people are now experiencing it through chat GPT. But I actually think the analysis still holds because my argument was, that our communication with computers is basically shaped and, and limited by the requirement that our actions are legible to them. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but it's also, I think, tremendously consequential. There's this necessary translation involved, and it shares some of the problems of datification that I was talking about earlier, um, because a great deal of what we rely on to make sense of each other, um, make ourselves intelligible to each other, that is not captured in the translation of our actions into machine readable bits. And that was really what came out of my analysis at the time. Uh, but, but that's the only thing that computational systems can register um, and can respond to. So, you know, the power of chat GPT then is it's tied to the amount of information that can be extracted from, from the regularities of language, of text, of images, when they're translated into bits. Uh, but what's lost, as you mentioned, is the dependency of our mutual sense-making on contexts that aren't reducible to data. So there are all of these things that, uh, that escape datification. And in the case of human communication, we're not just drawing from context as if it's something out there um, that, that we're surrounded by, but we're actively producing the context of our interactions together in and through the interactions. And that's what I mean, again, by open worlds. Um, and I think that really uh, defines the limits of the computational sensorium. You know, what is translatable to machine legible bits? Uh, what's lost in that translation? And if we don't recognize what's lost in that translation, then we don't understand the differences that really matter between human intelligence, human communication, or let's even say organic communication, because I would include here our communications with non-human animals, but we aren't taking seriously uh, the differences that matter between the resources that we draw on 
and what's available to even the most sophisticated computational systems. Lucy, I think that wraps up what we had talked about discussing, but is there anything that you know strikes you or that you'd like to, to discuss more? I would just add that for some years now, I've been thinking about, about targeting. Um, thinking about targeting as a kind of a, a priority that connects uh, the commercial and the military applications of, of AI technologies um, that we've been talking about. So whether we're talking about uh, market profiling, you know, in the first instance, or we're talking about threat identification in the second, in both cases, there are claims for, for you know, precision, for accuracy uh, that hide the actual vagaries and, and the real injuries of historical stereotyping and profiling. We see that even more in automated decision systems, both for forms of targeting, targeted advertising, targeted killing. Um, both of those rely on these stereotypes and, and profiles. Um, bo bo and both of them are driven by this this imperative to dominate. So that's driving the various arms races between the big tech companies, the frenzy now around, around large language models, is that it's it's imperative to dominate. You've got to have hegemonic power, um, and that's all based again on this dream of you know of omniscience that drives the surveillance business model. Uh, also, the military imaginaries of of joint all domain command and control. This dream of of being able to see everything, to know everything as a means to power. Uh, and so, I read that as a connecting thread that runs through the you know, the military industrial, and I would say now military industrial commercial uh, complex. Uh, and I think it's really all of our task to, to, to challenge that. And one way to do that, I think, is to destabilize the narratives that underwrite the current diffusion of, of data-driven algorithmic systems, uh, you know, under the sign of AI, by, by spotlighting um, really the self-interests of those who who are preaching this technological determinism, techno-solutionism. And in the case of the military and police and border operations, um, to do everything that we can to redirect all of the attention and resources that are invested um, really in maintaining the security of a relatively few, to redirect all of that to creative thinking, creative projects in demilitarization, um, in, in what would, I believe, be a much more genuine kind of planetary security um, for, for all. Uh, so, yeah, so I guess I would leave it with with those thoughts. I'm so glad that you you brought that up. And it, it calls out, I think, something that you mentioned at the start around, you know, the framing of artificial intelligence as having this sort of runaway capacity um, that we're moving rapidly towards existential risk, which implies a kind of helplessness and loss of control, but only in service of the reassertion of accelerating militarism, accelerating the development of these systems as a proxy for, for control. Right, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. This was an incredibly illuminating um, conversation, and I'm such an admirer and so appreciative of all of your work in this in this space. It's really crucial. Oh well, thank you, Sarah. The admiration is mutual, and and it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. 